Hello, everybody. A couple months back, I asked for everybody's help in filling out a form to gather some information on what people think about Hawaii's fisheries, Hawaii's fishing regulations, and a couple questions like that. Uh, I got all the data collected and put together, and I wanted to share back what I learned and what we collected uh, with everybody so they know how the project went, what was successful, and what's going to happen moving forward. Um, First things first, uh, the project itself was done for a Hawaiian studies class I had, Hawaiian studies 650, um, and was a huge success. Um, I was hoping that I would at least get 30 people to fill this out. That would have been successful in my mind. We got almost 400 people that filled out this questionnaire, which was a long questionnaire. Um, and speaking to people at the university that are actually doing like questionnaires and stuff, they're all mind blown about how successful this was, as was I. So huge, huge mahalo to everybody who took the time to fill this out. Um, hopefully we're gonna build something here that's gonna be useful going forward in Hawaii and perhaps other regions of the world as well. So I'm gonna run through this presentation and just summarize what happened, what the results were and why this project was done. So the title of the project itself was Stakeholder Engagement Through the Virtual Landscape. It was done um, again for the Hawaiian studies class. I'm a current graduate student at UH Manoa. I came back to school, if you haven't heard. Um, I'm in my second semester of my master's degree as a natural resource and environmental management uh, master's program. So a couple of terms we got to cover real quick, stakeholders and engagement. Um, this is going to get a little wordy, so I'm going to try to breeze through this and get to the cool actual data part. If you want to just skip to the data part, I'll uh, include some timestamps in the description of this video so you can do that. If you want to skip by and see what we're doing in the future, there'll be a timestamp down there as well, letting you know uh, where to look if you just want to watch that as well. Uh, so a stakeholder is any person or group that can or will be affected by an organization's decisions or strategies. So it's anyone that could be affected in the context of this project, um, anyone that could be affected by regulations of fisheries. So people who fish and use the water here in Hawaii. Why bother engaging? Uh, often it's a legal requirement. We can breeze over that. Lots of times, especially in government context, stakeholder engagement is required. More importantly though, neglecting it breeds failure. Yeah, so there's extensive examples of uh, environmental management programs that failed because they failed to think about the stakeholders. Uh, there's a park in East Africa protecting gorillas. Um, the park had all these regulations in place. The gorillas were still suffering. They had no idea why. Um, and after they actually sent someone out to speak to the indigenous people of the area, they figured out a little bit more of what was going on. Basically, there was an entire disconnect where the indigenous population thought things were going really well and hunting in these areas wasn't having a negative effect on the gorillas because no one was telling them any other information about it. Uh, so here's an example, created failure because they failed to talk to the stakeholders. Roy's in Hawaii is another good one, right? The state brought in Roy's thinking that everybody was gonna be super stoked and eat the Roy. Didn't bother talking to people wondering, well, would you wanna eat this fish or not? Now we have Roy's everywhere. Nobody wants to eat them. They're an invasive species and a big problem. And doing this just produces positive benefits. Yeah, leadership in general, ineffective. The people being led don't embrace the mission. When you're creating a government plan, people shouldn't just be told what to do, right? Everybody should want to have happen what's happening. It should make sense for the people being regulated as well for whatever needs to happen. It can't just be a one-sided thing. Like, hey, a fish pond, excellent example of good stakeholder involvement. Because they have good involvement, they got over 50,000 volunteers and the area is looking beautiful right now. If you haven't seen a fish pond, either if you're on Oahu, I recommend going and checking it out or just looking it up online. It's an awesome example. So in the past, finding these people, these stakeholders, people being affected by decisions, kind of a struggle. Yeah, the typical old way to do this was to throw it up on the news. Oh, this is happening. We want your input. Walk around in areas. Hope you stumble across the people you need to talk to. But Social media has changed that in my mind. And this is really what I'm trying to study and prove. Um, people on social media have 
created spaces and grown around these spaces of common interest, and which are often highly specialized around activity or place. So stakeholders, which were once spread over wide geographical areas, now they're existing online in these spaces. An example of this is social media influencers or content creators, as I like to refer to them. They create content on a specific place and subject. Example, this channel you're watching right now, we create content about fishing in Hawaii. Stakeholders of that subject, people interested about fishing in Hawaii, watch the content, right? And they gather around the content because it's what they're doing. They're fishing in Hawaii. They wanna see stuff about fishing in Hawaii. So myself, again, we create content here about fishing. Stakeholders, those who fish in Hawaii, gather around that content because they're interested in it. And this creates a really potent potential area for those looking to speak and understand groups of stakeholders to directly connect with them. Instead of just shotgun approach, put it in the newspaper, I hope the stakeholders pay attention to this, maybe, maybe not, who knows. They can target where the people are existing online and speak to them directly. Yeah, they don't have to hope they can actually find these people and directly contact them through the areas they're organizing online. So the thing is that it's not, this isn't really done in the context of government, right? It's, I'm not sure why. I think people just don't understand the tools. And more importantly, there's not a lot of proof of concept, not much research on showing, can you talk to stakeholders and like effectively identify them using social media? My idea is yes, you can. So these projects that I'm doing, this one was a pilot project that we're talking about now. Um, and then I'll talk about the future project, which is pretty exciting at the end of the video. So is there a need to engage with online stakeholders? I'd say, yeah, definitely. If you want things to work, you gotta talk to the people being affected. You can't just create this in a vacuum and hope it works. Can stakeholders be engaged through social media? So this was the project question that everybody helped with that filled out that form and interacted with that last video. Can stakeholders be engaged? And more importantly, does that even provide valuable information, right? And what do environmental agencies need to know to engage with these virtual stakeholder groups? Again, this number 401 might be the most important one for actually getting government to do this. This isn't a like, easy space to work in. If you don't use social media, you're not privy to how this works. You're not gonna understand how to do it, let alone why. So for the project methods here, I created a Google form used for stakeholder input. This is just kind of an imaginary let's see if we can get valuable information from fishermen in Hawaii. Yeah. So the Google form was targeted at doing that. And then I utilized social media to identify and engage with stakeholders and drive their interaction to the questionnaire. And then I ran some stats to determine if there's any useful data there. We'll co cover that too. And I summarized the protocol for future environmental agencies. So the questionnaire, those who did fill it out, again, huge, huge mahalo, way more successful than I thought it was going to be. And thanks to you guys, I got an A in, in that class. I entirely give that good grade to the kindness of everybody willing to fill this out. And hopefully we're going to turn it into something bigger and more effective that'll help the world in the long run. <clears throat> so the questionnaire itself had 24 questions in it, 16 yes and no, mostly demographics, backgrounds, stances on fishery regulations. There's one scale question, which is a one to 10 health value of a fishery multiple selection questions about uh, the cost of a potential fishing license, four open-ended, and two numerical questions. These were dropped in the analysis. This is my first professional form that I've made. Definitely stumbled a couple of times. Um, these two questions here were really hard to actually analyze, so I just dropped them. It was too much trouble, but they exist as data. So using social media, my idea, the core concept, what I would hope would happen in the future is that government agencies contract with content creators to create a bridge between the government and the stakeholders they're trying to reach. Yeah. So nowadays you probably see a lot of commercials on YouTube and things like that where content, what's being created, um, might be sponsored by a uh, Raid Shadow Legends, things like that. Yeah, there'll be a quick commercial and there's oh Raid Shadow Legends, da 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 da. My idea is well, instead of Raid Shadow Legends, why not? Here's a government project. We need your help, right? You connect the two dots right there, and you can identify stakeholders effectively based off of the content they like. Yeah. 
So I acted as that social media guy, right? I acted, I pretended that, oh, this imaginary government group contracted me to find out some stuff about fisheries and try to connect the fishermen with the government group. Yeah. So it's a proof of concept, um, which because it was successful, thanks to you guys again, we're actually moving forward with a real government agency. We'll talk about that at the end. So we made one video, which is posted on the 16th of November, which is accompanied by Instagram post to drive traffic to the video. Four Facebook groups were posted to on the 21st of November. Second Instagram posted 26th of November. And then we closed off the survey on the 27th. Here's just one of the posts, Facebook here. Here's some information on the YouTube video. Good views, got about 3,000 in the first uh, 10 days or so. For a video like this, I thought it was pretty awesome. And the amount of interaction you guys provided was amazing. Um, and the Facebook groups were surprisingly effective as well. The people in here really want to get engaged and involved with what's going on in their fisheries, right? Which makes sense. Everybody wants effective fishery managing and they don't want it to interfere with their lives to like extreme point, right? There's this balance point that everybody understands and wants to reach. At least that's what I understood speaking to all these people. So the survey results, this is kind of the cool part in my mind. Total of 389 responses. That's huge in my mind. 389 of you decided this was worth your time to fill out this long questionnaire. Again, a huge mahalo. Thanks to you. I got a good grade and hopefully we're moving forward with some really cool stuff here. 210 of these responses, roughly, these are all roughlies, came from the YouTube video, 165 from the Facebook, and 14 from the second Instagram post. This Instagram was a little harder to determine. Um, it's hard to track some of these. I could have done a better job at creating separate URLs so I could directly track which ones were being clicked. Didn't do that. But because I spread out the dates in general, this is how much came from each source. So here's some cool little data. We're going to run through this data and I'll show you the sheet as well. So do you live in Hawaii? We got a 85.6% of people that filled it out. Yes, they do. Do you fish in Hawaii? 94.9%. This is massive, right? So the whole concept here, I'm trying to show that you can effectively talk to stakeholders, communicate with them, engage with them using social media. And here we are, 94%, 95% of the people that filled this out fish in Hawaii, right? Those are the people that we imagining we want to talk to, people who fish in Hawaii, people that have the knowledge about the fisheries and what's going on there. Are you native Hawaiian? This one's huge in my mind too. Kanaka's 30%. Yes, that is huge in my mind. It's really a different, like you can imagine just wandering around the beaches trying to find Kanaka. Oh, you fish here? Oh, that's going to be super time intensive, hard, and probably not going to work that well. Yeah. In my mind, this is working extremely well. Do you fish for sustenance? Yeah, a large portion do, which just in itself should tell managers something, right? If you're regulating somewhere, you got to keep this in mind. 57% of the people filling out this form fish for sustenance. They fish for what they eat. They need access and they need healthy fisheries to eat. What do you think of the health of Hawaii's fisheries? Almost average five is what we got here, right around five. Not great, not super horrible, five. Couple outliers saying it was super cherry. Couple outliers saying it was awful. Sorry, this is the cherry area 10, awful the one. Most around here, the five realm. Some more stuff here. Should fishing be regulated? Most people say, yeah, there should be some regulation. Almost 90% of the people that filled this out said there should be some form of regulation for the fisheries. And then we get into some of the licensing questions, which I think are pretty cool. Do you think that, uh, there should be required license for fishing in Hawaii. Most people said, no, there shouldn't be a general license. About 50, uh, 60, 40 around there said, no, general license doesn't sound like a good idea to us. Do you think native Hawaiians, Kanaka should require one? Vast majority of people said, no, they do not think that Kanaka should have to have a fishing license. Do you think tourists should have to have one? Opposite here. Most people said, yeah, that's reasonable. And do you think, Fishing for commercial purposes should require a fishing line. Almost everybody said, yeah, if you're fishing to make money, you should probably have some form of fishing license. And this is an important one in my mind too. Do you think the state of Hawaii does a good job at managing fishing, fisheries? Most people are saying no. And if you're a government agency, 
that is good to know because if you know people think they're doing not the best job, you can identify why they think that. And if you identify why, there's probably some great knowledge in there that's going to make your practices a heck of a lot better. That's the whole purpose of stakeholder engagement in the basis, right? It's kind of a humility thing here. You're right. You understand you don't know everything. It's impossible. People on the ground doing the fishing, doing whatever the activity is you're looking at, they're going to know the most about it, right? Because there's so many of them and they're doing it much more than most of the people that regulate the thing. So some deeper analysis. I'm going to actually switch up the tabs here. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share two other tabs real quick. First thing I want to share, the full results of this here. We're not going to cover all these because there's so many. Um, for time's sake, I'm cutting it down. We covered these. How much time do you fish in a month? Hawaiian. What do you think the fisheries? Do you recreational fish? Most people that fill this out, yeah, they're rec fishing. Do you commercial fish? Most said no. We got about 10 people that filled this out that said yes. So in my mind, this is a question of did I fail to reach the commercial fishermen or are there just really not that many commercial fishermen? So if I had some other data of fishing licenses for commercial fishermen, I could figure that out, but I don't. So it's just an interesting thing to have there. Should be regulated. Um, we covered this. Do you think there should be a license for fishing in Hawaii? Most people said no. Hawaiian license, tourist license, sustenance, rec. This is an interesting one because before I started this project, I didn't even know this. Did you know that Bill HB1023 was signed into law, which requires out of state visitors to obtain a fishing license to engage with recreational fishing? Most people said no. I was in this group. I did not know this until very recently, which is, again, Part of this stakeholder engagement, the government and the people really should be meshing better, right? If this thing's happening, the people who fish, which most of the people that fill this out fish in Hawaii, yet we don't know this law happened, which goes right back up to here. Do you think tourists should have to have a fishing license? Most people said yes, but almost none of us knew that. Well, that happened. They do require one now. And this is a cool one. What do you think it should cost? If there was this imaginary fishing license, what do you think it should cost? Most people right here in this bracket, $1 to $25, the majority. If you're creating a fishing license, right? If you were to do such a thing, this data is important. You don't want to charge some unreasonable amount of money nobody's going to want to pay, right? It's got to be fair for everybody, yeah? So there's a balance point, and this kind of data is important if you're going to find that balance point. Can skip this one. Um, social media, does it help you understand regulations? So about 61% said, yeah, actually, social media is helping us understand regulations. Pretty good point to know. And then we get into the open-ended ones. There's so much good monolo in here for these. So much good input you guys put in this about specific stuff. What is your opinion of fishing licenses? What is your opinion of the health of Hawaii's fishing? Opinion of the management? and a concern. So we'll talk about a little bit of that in uh, one of the final slides of the presentation. But before we do that, I'm going to go back to the original presentation and then one other thing. So I used a program called R. I had all this data, right? This Google form puts all of these answers in a spreadsheet. And you can take that spreadsheet and you can plug it into a program called R. And R lets you take data and sort it effect, like way more easy than anything else. Basically, I can sort data by groups. I can run analysis between groups. I can do all this amazing things with R. And because I had this form in this easy spreadsheet format, I could just plug it into R and get some freaking awesome pieces of information. So I'm going to show you actually what that program looks like real quick so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, where is my R Studio? This is the program I'm speaking of. It's called R. It's a coding software that allows you to sort and understand data, right? So it just so happens that last semester, along with this Hawaiian Studies class, I was taking a class on how to use R, which 
was hard, but I'm so happy I did it because this thing is powerful. Um, you don't need to pay attention to too much of this. Basically, you just need to know that I can take data, plug it into this program, sort it however I want to sort it, and then compare between groups. We'll go into actually what that means. So back to our presentation. So deeper analysis. So I was just talking about we can sort the data between different demographics, right? So if I say, are you native Hawaiian? Yes or no. Do you fish for sustenance? Yes or no. I can sort between that. So are you native Hawaiian? One is going to always represent the yes. Zero, the no. Okay, one, yes. So yes, I'm native Hawaiian. Then I can determine how much of that group, the native Hawaiian group, fishes for sustenance. So over here, we see the total, right? Everybody that filled this form out, about 57% fish for sustenance. But when I sort it by, are you Hawaiian or not? Kanakas, almost 76% fish for sustenance, right? non kanaks a solid 50%, which is still an interesting value, right? But you can see here, there's a difference between Kanaka and not on your fishing, why you're fishing, right? Seems that if you're Hawaiian, more likely you're fishing for your food, which tracks with cultural tendencies. Yeah. Um, this is some sciencey stuff here. There's a value called a P value, which is this here. And this is just a value that a program using statistics can tell you how confident you are that this is a real correlation and not just accidental happens to look that way yeah so these are what we call correlations right there's not a cause and effect being proved here it's just it seems that yes being hawaiian is correlated with fishing for sustenance so correlation not causation you might have heard of that before it doesn't mean that being hawaiian causes you to fish for sustenance it's saying they're correlated. There's some sort of relationship here. And this value is telling you how confident you can be on that relationship. So what this means, this number here, is basically there's a 0.0001% chance that this is accidental and not a true correlation. So you can be very, very confident that this correlation is accurate based on the data we had. Let's go a little deeper. Are you Kanaka? Do you think there should be a license required for fishing in Hawaii? So the Ari Kanaka is over here on this side again. Actually, a little less. But we look at the p-value. There's almost a 50% chance that this is just random variation. This doesn't mean much of anything statistically. We can't make any conclusions off that. So, which is interesting because if you are a manager, you might want to know that it seems, based off this data set, that Kanakas, non-Kanakas view the requirement of fishing licenses similarly, right? There's a similar, it doesn't matter if you're Hawaiian or not so much on how you think about fishing licenses, according to this data. Again, this is real preliminary. Take all this with about a handful of salt. Um, I didn't word these the best. And this is a pilot test. This isn't actually proving or disproving anything. The whole purpose of this is if we were to do this fully well and properly, could we get useful data? So what do you think Hawaii's job at doing? How well do you think they do, right? One out of 10 or how, sorry about that. Do you think state of Hawaii does a good job managing fisheries? Yes and no. Most people said no. If you're Hawaiian, you're less likely to say yes, according to this data. But the p-value, we need this lower than 0.5. So we can't say that with much statistical certainty. There's a 10% chance that this is just random and not true. Going pretty deep here. I'm sorry if this is getting a little nuts. But it's real, in my mind, this is freaking really cool data. And I just want to share it back with everybody. You guys provided all this. And I want to provide as much detail as I can. This one's interesting to me. Do you live in Hawaii? So we sorted that into groups, those who said yes, those who said no. 
what do you think of the health of Hawaii's fisheries? If you live in Hawaii, on average, you're giving it a value of five. Not great, not good. But if you do not live in Hawaii, you're giving it a value of 6.2. So people who don't live in Hawaii think that the fisheries are more healthy than those who do, which makes sense in my mind because people who do live in Hawaii see the fisheries more often. They've interacted with them over a longer period of time. They've seen the changes and they understand probably more accurately the health of the fisheries. Where if you just come here, you have different context. You might be coming from an area that has no fish or really poor fisheries, or you just never seen these saltwater species. You just see one fish. You're like, oh, that is some healthy fisheries right there, right? So there's some differences here, which are interesting. And this is highly statistically significant is what we say when it, the data seems to matter. There's like a 0.00001% chance. This is random. I need some water. I'm freaking speaking it up right now. Okay. Do you live in Hawaii? Again, yeses and noes. Do you think the state does a good job at managing fisheries? This one was cool. Do you live in Hawaii? People that live in Hawaii, only 26% of them said, yes, the state is doing a good job. However, if you don't live in Hawaii, 64% say yes. So there's a huge discrepancy here. The vast majority of people that live in Hawaii that filled this out said that they're not doing a great job at managing the fisheries. People that don't live here, just visit, whatever have you, different perspective entirely. Very interesting. If I was a manager, I definitely want to know this because I'd want to target these people, this 26%, and figure out what could be done better. And talk to these people and see what do you think is going so well right there's some important trends that you can then dive deeper to talk to the people you need to talk to <clears throat> again almost a zero percent chance that this is just random like statistical error that seems to be a very strong correlation do you live in hawaii should tourists need a fishing license 80% of the people that live in Hawaii said, yeah, tourists should have fishing license. 66 that do not live in Hawaii said, yeah. So it seems that if you live in Hawaii, there's a higher chance that you think tourists should have fishing licenses. But there's still the majority of tourists or people that do not live here also think that tourists should have fishing licenses. Interesting to know. Point two. So there's a 2% chance that's random. And those are some that's I went into a little deeper depth. I'll provide a uh, link in the description of this. I wrote this all out for my class into a 26 page fat essay going over tons of little statistical differences, going over what I did exactly, going over why this is important and going forward topics as well. So if you're interested in diving deep, which this video is already getting pretty deep, I know, but if you want to go deeper, I'm going to put that link to that essay inside of the uh, description so you can check it out and read as much as you want. <clears throat> so again, we had four open-ended questions. So much knowledge in here. This is really like the pool of gold that if you're a manager, you could get some real cool stuff out of here. Interesting trend that I thought was really cool. What is your opinion about the state of Hawaii's management of fisheries? Roughly 88 people that responded to this mentioned there was either a lack of physical enforcement by state agents or that the state enforcement agency is underfunded. If I was that enforcement agency, this would be a huge piece of information for me. Yeah. People know that the state enforcement agents aren't there and they want to know why. And they some of them think they know why they're underfunded. There's a lot of pieces of information in here that are talking about, I called them before, they never showed up. I called them, I saw illegal stuff happening that was just totally wrong. No one showed up. Like, there's a lot of complaints about that. That's important to know if you're a manager. There's an immense data left. Tons of more ANOVAs, which are those tests to see if they're statistically valid, right? That percentage test I was talking about. Lots of things that I didn't do for the scope, that all this data, this immense data provided by all of you 
has a wealth of knowledge that could still be informed and mined out of here. So we're going to go back to the project questions. The purpose that I did this project for that class, the Hawaiian Study 650, is there a need to interact with stakeholders online? We said, yes, there is. If you want to have effective management, you got to talk to stakeholders. This online method seems to be a very efficient way to do it. Can stakeholders be engaged through social media? Yes, they can. This project showed that just one dude posting videos with his friends, people that fish in Hawaii gather around that, we get a community going, you can talk to that community and engage with a stakeholder that you like, right? You can imagine all the other avenues, right? There's not just fishing stakeholders, there's people who hike, you gotta target channels that do hiking, you know, just extrapolate that. You can talk to people online and you can target them and find them much more effective than wandering around outside, hoping you stumble across them. Can these engagements provide valuable information to environmental agencies? Yes, all that data we just went through, I would argue that is extremely valuable information, right? And we didn't even touch on the fact that the whole purpose of social media really is to build a relationship between two people or two entities. You could build massive relationships with your stakeholders, with those people that are being affected through social media. You can get information and understanding that's really hard to get through social media. Now, what does environmental agencies need to know to engage with these virtual stakeholder groups? <clears throat> so this is the information for moving forward, which is gonna go into my future projects, which I wanna share with you right after this. So their traditional method, you got your environmental agency, you got your traditional media, the news, the newspaper, advertisements, flyers, what have you. You're trying to use that to find your stakeholders, right? I don't know about you, but I don't know the last time I ever saw something on the news and was like, I better engage with that governmental group right there. No, it doesn't, not effective in my mind. This is what I think should happen more often. You have an environmental agency. They find a key social media influencer. They find somebody working in the space they're interested in. Someone who knows secondary social media influencers, right? Someone who's plugged into this community. The Hawaii fishing community is like basically bred the Hawaii fishing YouTube community. And the members that make up the fishing YouTube community are freaking awesome. Everybody interacts with each other's videos, right? We actually got a little sub community going of people that make videos about fishing in Hawaii. Find this guy who knows these guys together sponsor them talk to the stakeholders right that way you're targeting the stakeholders based off of what they watch and care about so environmental agency should scout this guy the key smi in good standing with the community and already network with second smis contact the primary and secondaries create content explaining the project goals and the expectations of stakeholders Freedom for the uh, social media influencers production content is critical. So don't, if you're a government agency, don't say you got to say this exact paragraph just like this. No, you got, they're talking to the people they know. They have relationships. Let them build those relationships how they best feel fit. Get the key message. We are organization X. We're thinking about doing Y. We need to talk with your community. Please bridge the gap however you see fit. This is super important. It might be more important than everything I talked about up here. Ethical, uh, ethical integrity is required on the part of the environmental agency. Huge sticking point in my mind. Stakeholder communities must be treated with respect and stringent honesty. Stakeholders and social media influencers will refuse to interact with future initiatives should they feel exploited which would ruin the virtual landscape for any future agency and potentially cause existing programs to fail. If the governmental agency does not treat the stakeholders with honesty and respect, they will poison the relationship between the government agencies and those stakeholders, right? It's just as simple, simple as 
a, any relationship. Yeah, it's got to be a true and honest two-way communication. You, if there's any kind of trickery or shenanigans or just not letting people know this is the project, right? Straight up, here's the project. Here's what we're thinking of doing. Here's what we need from you to make sure that we do things right. Here's the process, things like that. They have to be transparent, totally honest, and respected. Key, respected, right? If you get information that you aren't looking like, oh, I didn't, I don't think that's true. If you're the government agency, be got to be super humble and really treat the stakeholders as a valuable, valuable, valuable asset. Because at the end of the day, there are going to be the people out there being faced with the regulations. There are going to be the people out there actually telling people, hey, you can't do that. You can't dump poison in the water to kill the fit. You know, they're going to be the people out there that matter. They're the ones that matter. And they're the ones that need to have their voice in the part of building any kind of government plan. Yeah, it's going to be so much, so much more effective if this is a teamwork, right? If the environmental agency and the stakeholders work together to solve a solution, it's going to be infinitely more important and work way more better than if it's just one-sided, oh, here's what you guys got to do kind of thing. No. And again, I can't stress this enough, that ethical integrity. Yeah, there's so much historical evidence of stakeholder groups being lied to, being abused, being manipulated. This is a fresh landscape, this virtual landscape. We take the historical facts into this landscape, of course, but if there's any shenanigans, this virtual landscape, the doors would quickly slam shut on any future initiatives. You're not going to be able to come back and be like, oh, sorry, we lied about this or that. Not that that would ever happen. It's just important to say ethical integrity is 100% requirement for this to work and continue working. Okay, now that we covered all that, this is the what now. So I wrapped up that project. We turned it in, gave a presentation to the class. Thanks to all of you. Got an A. Huge mahalo again. Massive mahalo. Um, and now what's going to happen? So because that was so successful, I could treat it as a pilot project and show, oh, government agencies, look, this actually works. Here's some evidence that my idea works. So the program I am, the Masters of Environmental Management, the last thing we have to do is called a capstone project. It's kind of like a thesis. You have to work with some sort of group agency individual, and you have to solve one of their problems, and it has to be tied to the environment. So I found that agency, the Department of Aquatic Resources, DAR. They understood the value of talking to their stakeholders, right? They get it. They understand the historical things, bringing in Roy, all these things that happened in the past, the people that are there now in the present understand how important it is to understand people who fish, people who use the beaches. They need to know their stakeholders. They need to have plans in place that are going to work. So I have two upcoming projects that I'll talk about real quick. This is the most important one in my mind. This is the main project, my capstone project, yeah? I'm going to test if this method can work in real life. So what we did with this Hawaiian studies class, this pilot, I tested if it feasibly could work. Yeah, we have this data, but there was no real government tie-in, right? We're not actually building that relationship. Now we got the green light to build that relationship. So I'm going to test if I can use this social media method that we talked about in this last however long of this presentation to connect the government with stakeholders. The government, specifically to the talk, excuse me, the Department of Aquatic Resources is changing rules around Hawaii's nearshore waters. There's a lot of rule change coming up, everybody. And speaking as someone who fishes in Hawaii and knows a lot of fishermen, it is super important that we, the fishermen and people that use that, have our voices heard in these changes. And, you know, it's two sides of the coin, yeah? These guys, they want to talk to us. And if they don't... It, they're just going to create something in a vacuum and 
I mean, we all understand that that's not going to work. Yeah. You can't just patch something together and stick it out there and expect it to work. Yeah. We need to have a actual connectivity, a community going on here between those who are making the rules, those who are affected by the rules, finding that middle ground of what works in real life. Part of that as well, they're trying to create more community managed areas, right? So there's all these smaller areas where the community takes charge of that area on how they want it to be managed, what time they're gonna close breeding seasons, all these different rules, right? The community charges that. And the DAR wants the community to be empowered to do that. But in order to do that, they need stakeholder input. So main project, is going to be that I'm going to test if I can find and contact stakeholders and plug them in with the DAR through social media. There's a need to speak with those who use the areas to create successful rules that are embraced and not just enforced, right? This is what it's all about. We need both sides of the table, government and the community to both agree on ideas being good. It can't just be one oh this is just happening no it's got to be agreed whole point of stakeholders engagement so where i acted as basically that content creator for that project we just talked about this one i'm hopefully going to get actual real life funding and be able to sponsor actual real life content creators which is now the current need I need to speak to you, the content creators, people who fish and dive, anything related to that, YouTubers especially. I need to get your email addresses. I need to start emailing you. We need to plug each other in because fingers crossed, the DAR is really embracing this. They're going to put some money up front and I'm going to be able to actually sponsor segments of content, right? So it's going to be good for everybody i hope that's the key right we want this holistic good for everybody thing and we're going to do that sponsored segments so the content will create a campaign certain time period pushing a certain meeting all post videos around the same time and maybe 30 to 60 seconds sponsored segment in that content explaining what is being done why it's important how to connect and we'll get into those details as the project builds out but for now, if you're a content creator, I'm gonna put my email in the description, shoot me an email, please, please shoot me an email. If you don't wanna do that, drop a comment, I'll reach out to you, I'll find your email. If you watch other content creators, please hook me up and spread the word. Let them know what's coming down the pipes. Yeah, this is moving forward in the coming months. I just need to start building this community of content creators. And through that community, hopefully we're gonna reach a ton of those stakeholders, people that are watching this video right now, and things are gonna be built out in a way that works and is best for everybody and the environment. So that's the main project and where we're at. Need those content creators. Smaller class projects. And if you're a content creator, don't be surprised if I start dropping comments on your videos about asking to speak to you or just drop one in this one and we'll get it going now. I have a smaller craft project as well. They're testing, um, basically we're testing the public's perspectives of the health of an area, how useful that area is to them, what they do there, do you fish there, how useful is the fishing for you, how important, and how regulation affects that. The DAR recognizes that just closing out an area is not a great option, yeah? People, especially in Hawaii, rely on these areas for a multitude of things F fishing for food that's a big one also just cultural ties they might have fished there for generations you don't know how tied in they are you can't just tell them can't fish here anymore no 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 i don't care how many generations you feel like that is not the way to go the dar gets that so they want to have a protocol where they can test and find out what the area is being used for how healthy it is and how regulations might affect that that's what we're working for on this smaller class project. This is just getting flushed out. This week is we're really starting to flush this out. So it's a work in progress and I'll post some updates as they come. And that's it, the conclusions. If you have questions, please drop them into the comments. Um, if there's enough of them, maybe we'll make another little Q and A 
stream or Q&A video, something like that. Otherwise, I'll just answer the questions in the comments. Uh, we went over a ton of like pretty complicated stuff today. So hopefully I explained it in a way where it's understanding and it makes sense for everybody. But if it doesn't um, and I failed to make it clear, tell me because I need to be able to explain this stuff clearly to everybody um, and spam me with questions, spam me with ideas of people to work with, right? Those content creators. Um, if you are one of those content creators, double spam me um, and let everybody in the community know about what's going on with this project. And we're gonna move forward from here. That is it. Yeah, that is it. I'm gonna make sure there's no more slides. Huge mahalo for watching and double huge mahalo for everybody that hooked it up by filling out and interacting with that form. Um, thanks to you guys, not only was I successful in that class, um, I have a project to move forward with, which was a huge stress last semester. Like, oh, Kapona, you better have your project coming down the pipelines. It's due at the end of two years. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Trying to explain to the uh, department that I'm in school with, um, really this whole concept I'm doing now, plugging in government agencies that work with the environment, with their stakeholders using social media, hasn't been done in academia. Uh, people were very confused about what I was talking about. So being able to do this pilot, have it successful thanks to all of you, and be able to therefore show them and explain to them, here's what I'm trying to do. This is what it's all about, right? And they're, oh, got it. Okay, green light. That helped a lot. So again, huge mahalo. Let me know any questions you have. That's really going to be it. Again, thank you all. Uh, I'll talk to you soon with another update. Sorry, this one took a little while to get out. But until the next one, doo -doo